here. Okay, and with a brief introduction. Okay, so and with some technical information. So hi everybody, welcome to the virtual conference Reimagining Our Worlds from Below, organized by the Society for the Study of Social Problems through its two committees that address the transnational initiatives, the Transnational Initiatives Committee and the Ad Hoc Virtual Transnational Initiatives Committee. This conference is hosted by the Orfalia Center for Global and International Studies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Thanks for being here today. Today we are session three, developing feminist leadership and research on movements and indigenous communities in the global south that is co-organized by Ligaya Lindy McGovern from the Indiana University, USA, and Morena Tartari, University of Southampton in the UK, that is me. And before starting uh, uh, with, I would like to remind you some general rules and guidelines for the, web, for the, um, the session. Please, uh, please keep your microphones muted to avoid echoes. Uh, using a headset is preferable. And uh, uh, if you are experiencing bandwidth issues, uh, try turning off your camera. This session um, will be recorded, uh, recorded. If you do not agree with the recording, you should leave the virtual room. And uh, in the chat box, uh, you will find two items. Um, both of the links are posted on the front page, also um, on the conference uh, front page as well. So the first um, link uh, concerns uh, the guest book. Uh, you can add your name to the um, SSP Transnational Initiatives Committee guest book uh, if you want to receive future announcement uh, about the committee, for example, for conference and events. And uh, uh, the second link uh, um, is to provide feedback uh, about the conference. So this live session will last uh, one hour and a half. And for questions and comments, you can use the chat box or raise your hand on, and join the discussion. <laughs> so today we have uh, uh, we asked the four papers uh, um, that you can uh, find on the web. Uh, the video presentation you can find the video presentation on the uh, web page. The first paper is from uh, uh, Debra Bharata Baral, Bennett University, India, dedicated resisting land acquisition. The second pay, uh, paper from decriminalization to cultural legitimation narratives of lived experience of, of LGBTQ communities in India is by Heya Datta, Louisiana State University. The third uh, paper is uh, from Fiaya Tamlarai, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee not asking to be their stepwife, patriarchy, and with, uh, within gender struggles of women street vendors in urban Nepal. And the last paper is from, uh, um, presented by Lidaya McGovern, a feminist research agenda for a global women's movement against new, new liberalism, focus on the global South. So sorry for my pronunciation. And if I made mistake about your name, please correct me. And so I, I yes, I, I leave the floor to you for the discussion and presentation and uh, to Ligaya. Okay, so my uh, presentation, I have entitled it Agenda for Feminist Research for Contesting Neoliberal Regimes. And I, let's see. Uh, just let me just remove some of these ads that are coming up. Okay. So I will uh, focus my discussion on three themes. Uh, what are the dimensions of research? And research as political engagement for social change and social justice. And then I will provide suggestions for feminist research agenda for contesting neoliberal regimes uh, towards uh, a deglobalized world. So what are uh, the dimensions of feminist research? I think it's important to take a review of this before we talk about uh, implications for uh, contesting uh, research, uh, contesting neoliberal globalization. Uh, uh, contesting neoliberal globalization. 
So one of the dimensions of feminist research is that the research connects to feminist struggle. A feminist struggle to change society so that it's more just and uh, the liberation of women. But in some literature, it's not only the struggle of women, it's not only for the liberation of women, uh, but also for the liberation of other marginalized groups in society. And then femi <clears throat> feminist research documents the experience of women and their concerns. Uh, we can begin to think about organic feminist uh, inquiry. Some graduate students have used this in their thesis, um, for example, which begins uh, from the experience of women. Even the questions that we formulate for inquiry, we look at the experience of women, what are the things that they are concerned about in their everyday lives. And we need to recognize the differences in the way women experience oppression uh, based on class, race, ethnicity, and nationality, uh, because uh, people from different positions of power have definitions and perceptions and even uh, uh, notions about oppression and uh, liberation. And dimension, uh, another dimension is that the subjugated knowledge of women uh, is an earth. And there are relations of ruling and within these relations of ruling, there are again, power, sub power structures and non, women's knowledge are usually marginalized in this case. And feminist research challenges structures and ideologies that oppress women. Um, it's not only, for example, relations between men and women, but looking at the different structures, economic, political, uh, social, and other uh, uh, ideologies about uh, men's and women's place in society. Then it fosters empowerment and emancipation of women and other marginalized groups. So research, the product of our research should somehow contribute to the emancipation of women. And here is where women's struggles are also allied with the struggles of other uh, marginalized groups and subjugated uh, groups in society. And there is something unique in feminist research, the concept of reflexivity, where we also look at how we are affected by the way we do research, <clears throat> by the way we relate to the subjects of our research. Uh, from our own standpoint, how are we beginning, in, how do we begin, for example, in the process of research, how do we design it? Uh, because of our positions in society. And academics sometimes have a privileged position. And so when we look at women uh, who are oppressed based on class, race, ethnicity, and other uh, uh, factors, we need to take a look at our own positionality in society. Now, it looks like from my own research about feminist research that uh, feminist research did not really emerge uh, out of the blue, that there were already some theoretical foundations uh, from which it emerged. And in my review of this research <clears throat> for many decades now, let's say uh, 25, more than 25 years, there's something that, I, uh, that is important to take a look at, cognitive justice. What is this cognitive justice? It's our ability to think against dominant knowledge. And this is essential for transforming society. How our own ideas, how our own frames of reference when we interpret reality uh, somehow contribute to the subjugation, subjugation of others and their understanding about society. There's also this body of literature uh, that uh, argue, uh, uh, argues about that researchers, feminist researchers, not necessarily feminist researchers, but that researchers should also be engaged in the struggles uh, for justice or against oppression, against exploitation, uh, and um, the subject's participation in the research process. So that the research process 
but also become liberating for those that we study. So there is, for example, the notion of community action research, participatory action research, indigenous forms of community engagement, advocate research, insurgent research, the idea, especially for <laughs> academics, that our research should not be merely extracting, meaning we just get information and then we don't do much. And the information sometimes in, and the, the way we're doing research and why we do research sometimes is self-centered. It's just because we want to get uh, academic promotion or so forth. So there is also this body of literature that talk, talks about grassroots oriented research, that we begin our research uh, from the experience of those who are marginalized or exploited. So if we are going to talk about development projects or study development projects, who are the grassroots involved in there and how are they affected? And <clears throat> uh, literature of indigenous communities also uh, bring, brings us attention to looking at the context of research. Uh, such as looking at the history and misrepresentation of certain groups, um, such as, for example, indigenous communities calls our attention to critical analysis of colonialism. And to be humble enough for those of us who are in the Western world to, to accept the fact that Western scientific re uh, research could have been used for as a mechanism of colon uh, colonization. Now, those, for example, who advocate qualitative uh, inquiry as social justice, like Norman Denson, uh, his whole uh, uh, argumentation somehow finds kinship with feminist research. So uh, in coming up and reflecting about feminist research agenda for contesting neoliberal globalization, there are three themes that I will uh, focus activist response, uh, issues needing more attention, epistemological and methodological concerns, and what are the implications of these for feminist research? First, now let's move on to uh, activist uh, response. There is an emerging movement uh, uh, called the deglobalization movement, and this is just beginning, and it's, 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 it's a very interesting uh, an important movement because it's looking for ways to move away from neoliberal development. So it's blazing uh, uh, for those who are un living under neoliberal nation states. This movement uh, is uh, a good movement to participate in. And there is also there are also challenges to global capitalism. Uh, Global capitalism is the neoliberal economic project of globalization, neoliberal globalization. And so there are, for example, uh, resistance from uh, labor unions. Um, and there are also challenges to imperialism and more. There's a big movement here in the US and, and then globally uh, because imperialism has been used to expand capitalism uh, globally and war. Uh, is used to occupy uh, lands in order to control the development and the resources of the occupied uh, territories. And there are also challenges to international institutions of finance capital, such as the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, whose structural adjustment policies imposed, and I don't hesitate to say imposed, on borrowing countries somehow uh, really destroy the economies uh, of these uh, uh, countries. And interestingly, because this is my current research, there's a growing resistance among indigenous people, uh, workers, peasants, and migrants. Indigenous people, because they are the ones who are most affected by transnational corporations going into other countries. And here we find in many of these researches, uh, <clears throat> politics of dispossession of indigenous land. And we find also uh, from workers because they are uh, the ones who are most uh, directly uh, connected with transnational corporations. Uh, 
uh, searching for cheap labor and peasants uh, are also as transnational corporations, which, is, which are the instrument of global capitalism, penetrate uh, agricultural and agribusiness development in third world countries. For, uh, and there are a good number of literature on this. Now migrants provide cheap labor in wealthier countries. And so there, there's also this growing resistance. Uh, among them, uh, for example, migrants from Indonesia, uh, migrants uh, from uh, uh, other Asian countries and other uh, Africa going, for example, to Europe, US and uh, the newly developing countries uh, in Asia. <clears throat> so what are the questions for feminist research inquiry? So we can take a look at what initiatives are taking place among grassroots women in the global south, but also to take a look at the global north. Uh, that can be considered part of the deglobalization movement. There's very little research because this is just beginning. I prepared a paper I, uh, on the deglobalization de movement, and I could hardly find literature. There's still very little. Then what forms of resistance among women and men in the global North uh, and South that challenge global capitalism? Uh, there are centers of power uh, that develop as global expand both in the neoliberal uh, nation states as well as in the global economy and as well as in regions, for example, in Africa, Asia, with the growth of China, uh, imperialist power of China in, as well as in Europe. So what centers of power do they target? And what problems and obstacles uh, do they pose to their collective actions? It's important to document this. Then how are imperialisms gendered? If you take a look at the war in, um, in Ukraine now, there are different imperialisms <laughs> interplaying. Uh, and a, uh, an important research to look at is how is this gendered? What are, what, how are men and women and children affected differentially? And what forms of solidarity are taking place among women workers, uh, peasants, urban poor, indigenous people in the global South and in the global North? I had a colleague who, who said to me, why do you always say global north and global south? Within the global north, there's also a global south, right? That's why it's important uh, to uh, look at uh, the peripheralization within the global north and the super peripheralization, peripheralization of the global south. <clears throat> now, what substantive issues uh, I see need more attention and what are the implications for this for feminist research. In the latest phase of global capitalism, extractivism seems to be uh, the, the emphasis. And there is, this is the unbridled extraction of raw materials. And this has really uh, this, uh, uh, serious environmental destruction. And when you in destroy the environment, you destroy livelihoods, you do not only destroy the air, the water, uh, the food systems, you threaten food security. Uh, and so this is really a, a serious concern. And indigenous people are uh, very much affected. In fact, I would say uh, the ones who are most affected because extractivism, uh, transnational corporations go to lands that are still unexpected. Lord and indigenous communities um, uh, uh, usually you stay in the in the mountains and where you can gold and mining and everything uh, that extractivist uh, uh, investment and penetration of the global economy. That's why I call extractivism as the last frontier of global capitalism. And there is the connivance of the state and transnational corporations in extractivism. And so uh, if there is connivance of the state and transnational corporations, you begin to see already the centers of power that resistance target and the complexity. So it's important that <clears throat> we take a look at the details and the dynamics of resistance and opposition. Now, what are the implications for feminist research on this? 
it's important now to document and inquire what forms of extractivism are taking place in the global south, global north, and how are they affecting men, women, and children? So it's not, as for example, in my own research, I see corporate mining start uh, expanding in different parts of the world, especially the global south, but also there are extractivist uh, uh, activities within the global north. Uh, and children are least uh, studied. And it, it's important to also organize the children, the youth. Then examine how environmental destruction brought about by extractivism impact men, women, and children differently because of their positions in the community and in the family uh, relations, family economy. Uh, children uh, migrate, for example, and men migrate. I met in my own research uh, indigenous people, men moving to the, rural, uh, to the urban areas, women being displaced because of corporate mining from their ancestral land. Uh, and some are thinking, oh, I will just go and be maybe a, be a domestic worker in other countries. Then we already know what would, uh, are the consequences of that. So as indigenous men and women are most affected by extractivism, uh, it's important now to document how they're fighting that. How do they frame issues? And what issues can we learn from them in their notions about the uh, correlation between health and environment, uh, between food systems and environment? And how do they conceptualize uh, deglobalization? Because these are, uh, for example, uh, I would say that uh, indigenous lands, indigenous communities, as frontier of capitalism, communalism. So there is, uh, uh, that's, that's actually against capitalism that uh, promotes individualism and private capital. So what are the epistemological and logical concerns and issues? Uh, one thing I see is <clears throat> how, uh, how do we know what we do not know and what can we know in a way that is emancipatory for the participants' research? So really here, femin the, some of the dimensions of feminist research uh, are uh, coming in again. And what strateg strategies can we use to give the subjected knowledge of indigenous communities, uh, how can uh, be heard, not only in our research, not, but also in policy. Our research must influence policy and must um, become uh, insurgent in terms of the power of transnational corporations, in terms of power of transnational corporations, uh, because they also have their own interpretation and um, uh, frames uh, about how development should take place and impose them in other uh, groups globally. So the implications for feminist research is each of the dimensions of feminist research that I have discussed earlier would be most useful in giving voice to the marginalized men and women. Not all of them uh, might be useful. Uh, so it's again, uh, we, we again have to use, a, use our cre creativity, but also consultation uh, with the people that we study. So what do we do with the outcomes of our research that will meaningfully impact the empowerment of men and women in the process of deglobalizing the political economy? So one dimensions of deglobalization movement is to begin thinking about ways we can organize work, ways about we can use natural resources, ways we can use, for example, uh, the resources that we extract, ways that we can get to think between human lives, human dignity, and the pursuit for profit. Now, I have done some publications that somehow relate to feminist research. 
uh, the globalization labor expert and resistance a study of Filipino migrant domestic workers in global cities where I have uh, done field work in Hong Kong, Rome, uh, Taiwan, uh, Vancouver in Canada <clears throat> and of course Chicago and tried to look at the resistance of domestic workers who are working in, in this country. So uh, migration of, of uh, Filipino women uh, to other wealthier countries. And some of them work not only uh, at double work. They work at home, but they also work in small enterprises of uh, uh, capitalists in other countries. Then there, this is, uh, this is where I evolved the concept of organic feminist inquiry, Filipino peasant women exploitation and resistance, uh, because oftentimes we think that women are not linked to transnational, uh, peasant women are not linked to transnational capital, but in fact, they are very much linked. Uh, and there is also these forms of resistance. Uh, combining with uh, peasant uh, men. And the last two volumes, uh, Globalization and Third World Women, uh, Gender and Globalization Patterns of Women's Resistance. This is a good collection of uh, feminist scholars looking at how women in Africa, Asia, Latin America, even in the global north uh, and other, uh, I have not included her Middle East, uh, uh, are, are resisting uh, neoliberal globalization. And there are also articles, and my favorite is The Marxist Feminism for a Global Women's Movement Against Capitalism. I argue that Marxist feminism can be a good framework for studying uh, uh, women's resistance against capitalism, but also as a framework for organizing them in order that they gain collective power. And there is also grassroots oriented research as political engagement for social justice, exposing corporate mining in indigenous context in the Philippines. This is very much related to extractivism uh, and uh, somehow influenced by my notion of grassroots oriented research to begin looking at, if we are looking at corporate mining and who are the grassroots here, it's the indigenous people. So that's where I began my inquiry. Then neoliberal globalization and transnational women's movements in the early 21st century, there are these really transnational networks, transnational movements based in, in neoliberal uh, nation states uh, that's really growing. It's, it's very interesting to take a look at how this is expanding. There's, for example, the international uh, women's uh, as uh, association uh, it began five years ago, and uh, uh, it addresses imperialism, it addresses war and neoliberalism, and we have named people from the Middle East, Cuba, Africa, uh, and it's still alive after five years of, of tedious work. Uh, then, of course, uh, I have mentioned this already, and uh, neoliberal, glo neoliberal globalization in the Philippines, its impact on Filipino women and their forms of resistance. Uh, of course, I focus mostly my research on Filipino women and the Philippines because the Philippines is a classic example of a neoliberal nation state. Uh, there is, of course, resistance from below, uh, but the state and other uh, transnational corporations and then resistance is, is uh, may, uh, resistance is contained, and you have the United States continuing to provide military aid to an oppressive uh, regime. Uh, so this is where I end, and uh, thank you very much. That's my uh, email, and I'm happy to uh, converse later. Thank you. Thank you, Ligaya, for your presentation. Uh, we can leave the floor to Heya Data. All right. So um, this is the name of my topic from decriminalization to cultural legitimization, narratives of lived experiences of LGBTQ communities in India. Um, so uh, recently uh, in 2019, until that point of time, um, same-sex relationships have been 
uh, criminalized uh, from since the time of the colon British colonial rule in India, that is almost 1860s. And um, same-sex relationships have been sort of criminalized and looked down upon, and, ha and hence the LGBTQ uh, population has remained marginalized in the Indian society for so long. But uh, recently, this Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act have been marked as one of the uh, one of the uh, groundbreaking um, revolutionary act that has been passed by the Supreme Court of India because it has almost read down uh, 200 years of the colonial law that had so long uh, marginalized the sexual minorities in India. Now, the significance of the act is probably very little on the lives of uh, the people in India, given the fact that it's too recent and uh, there has been minimum research that has been done on the on the Indian society. And uh, also the fact that uh, this this law only has I'm sorry, I don't know why that happened. This <clears throat> law uh, only had um, certain certain uh, um, certain privileges. That is, it only uh, recognized a third third group of gender, which it labels as, as the third gender and gives people the right to select uh, select their gender in case they do not identify themselves in the uh, binary gender category. But that is that I would say that's just the just the beginning of the change, and the Supreme Court uh, is yet to yet to go ahead for more, more changes and more laws are yet to come across. So basically what I'm doing in my research is that I am trying to capture the transition between how legal, 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 I, I'm sorry, legally enacting a law uh, affects the cultural change in, a, in the society. So, uh, and like I said before, that there has been a gap in the literature because historically, which I'm which I'm coming in the next slide, historically Indian culture uh, showed a much more tolerance towards homosexuality. I I believe this word is kind of outdated right now, but when I'm talking about history, this word has a has a significance. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, try to fill in the gaps in the literature through my research. Uh, by providing information how uh, from from the Indus Valley civilization till the point of uh, uh, coloni colonization and then for post colonization how culture and how social codes on accepting same sex relations have been transitioning. So uh, mainly I'm going to focus on three research themes in my paper that is how has the enactment of the law Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act 2019 affected the identities of LGBTQ persons in India? Secondly, how is the legal change being culturally accepted? And lastly, how do the legal changes affect LGBTQ persons' thoughts on the idea of family and parenthood? Historically, um, so, so, in 1960, the, the section 377 of the Indian Penal Code uh, criminalized a homosexual relationship which said that whosoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman, or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life and shall be liable to fine. And the explanation that was provided was penetration is sufficient to constitute the carnal intercourse necessary to the offense described in this section. However, uh, this I'm talking about the 1860s, but prior to that, <clears throat> prior to that, Indian culture uh, has shown in, in, its, in, its, in its scriptures, such as the mythologies, or um, Hindu or Buddhist religious texts, how rituals were performed to give equal importance to same-sex friendship or relationship. And unlike in the modern times where same-sex relationship stops 
at certain point we cannot imagine beyond friendship like same sex relationship do not have a legitimization of uh, any romantic romantic intent after a, of after a certain point that was not the case that is projected in the indian scripts which we see from its religious uh, texts so those cultures have been the indigenous culture have been therefore affected from the colonial period where the indigenous culture have been ruptured uh, through reinterpretation uh, from the colonial perspective. More, moreover, in the present time, the media representation has, has sort of uh, brought in front of us the Western form of same-sex relationship of, of what we understand the LGBTQ community to be is is kind of like an imitation of the western society so the indigenous nature of the society or for example i would i would like to uh, elaborate this with an example let's say the word transgender in the english dictionary or in the western society the word transgender is sort of um, cannot be you uh, implemented or applied to describe in a culture like india because there, there are several indigenous terms which do not fit in under the umbrella term of transgender. Now, this leads to an identity crisis. Now, there, th these are the gaps that needs to be fill up, filled out. And I, I believe that through my research, I might be able to do that. So the journey of legalization, legalization uh, had begun since the 1994 in India, at least since then that has been documented when uh, one of the non-governmental organization known as the known as the AIDS Bhed, Bhedbhav Virodhi Andalan in English that would mean mobilization against discrimination. This was a group that first raised voice against uh, criminalizing same-sex relationship and ma mainly they raised voice against how the health issues should be a concern for the government and how sexual minorities should be taken care of. Secondly, uh, and, and hence from 1994, we see that there has been several media representation and how, uh, how films, theaters, drama, poems, most importantly, have sort of highlighted the importance of um, a same-sex relationship and how it has tried to uh, modify the culture. 2009-2013 uh, marks marks one of the uh, one of the most important uh, movements or or perhaps important steps in the Indian society, where two major cases, the Nas Foundation versus the government of NTC of Delhi. And uh, in 2013-14, the Nalsa case uh, had, had led the Supreme Court to actually uh, grant this, uh, this third category of gender, which is perhaps one of, one of the most important changes because it at least recognizes, uh, recognizes gender and sexual identity beyond the binary category. I'm going to use... Uh, the inter intersection between several theories. First is the feminist and queer theories, which believes that there has been minimum research on, on, on the sexual minorities in both the cases when they have been the victim or the offender. There has been very less of research on this. Secondly, I would be utilizing the labeling theory and uh, adjusting to is adjacent to it is the shaming reintegrative theory which suggests that how labeling or or due to due to the existing uh, hegemonic social codes how labels uh, how labels uh, is invoked through social interaction in a given society and how that affects uh, people's identity culture and how that can predict one's behavior and lastly, I would be utilizing the ecological theoretical framework, where uh, where where it where, where it argues that 
any action, any minimum action can can affect the larger uh, larger part of the society. So it, it is kind of going from a micro perspective to a macro perspective. Okay, so in my paper, I I would be uh, sort of uh, dividing it into three three parts. The first part deals with romantic relations, politics of friendship, and gender performativity. So, uh, so in the Indian culture, we have seen from uh, historical historical texts, mythologies, and previous research that how our gender performances, even with uh, our uh, our, our gender actually interferes with our interaction with the society in our daily life. So, for example, as women, um, we might be more uh, we might be more uh, accepted to be physically closer with with our same sex partners because that is thought to be more feminine within quotes. But those same things are not legitimized for men because being physically intimate is not very masculine. So the, these, are, these are some of the ways how friendship relations build up and our interaction sort of uh, shapes the way we see relationships and how, how this also sort of invokes homophobic nature in, in given social spaces. Uh, in India, the gender has played a major role in uh, nation building because women especially have been have been um, uh, represented as the backbone of culture spirituality and uh, they have been given the role to maintain that feminine and masculine divide which sort of makes it more difficult uh, which sort of do not recognize that how gender roles can be can can sort of uh, it can be interlinked with each other or in reality how the boundaries are sort of blur second i would be talking about family as a concept because uh, because traditionally it has been a very dominant idea about how we think of uh, a, a, on a heterosexual family formation now even the law social structure and and the culture social code it supports the uh, heterosexual form of family building and therefore uh, marginalizing any other non heterosexual forms of family relationship so moreover there are patriarchal uh, values influence of the media reinforcement of the motherhood these are the things that have affected the idea of family and how this idea has been very rigid to the uh, rigid in the indian indian social scenario given the fact that family also plays a major role in in politics and nation building so that makes even more difficult for uh, sexual minorities to come up with a different form of family uh, idea and and we still do not have that legal permission for that so therefore, uh, some of my some of my findings have suggested how how uh, sexual minorities uh, depend on friendship networkings and uh, family family uh, family support to actually practice their preferred form of uh, sexuality and gender roles. Lastly, I would be talking about parenthood and adoption. And uh, since, like, after after talking about family, I think parenthood and parenthood and adoption have been seen as one of the major symbols of a family, irrespective of uh, the gender composition of couples. So, parenthood gives a uh, gives an identity. It is not only a self identity, but it is also a social identity that that uh, supports the idea of the family having children in in uh, in the in the union of the couple sort of gives a social legitimization and social support of uh, labeling 
that relation as a as a family which is the word family over here becomes uh, very important as it signifies the depth of the relationship that is shared between the parents and the children uh in the in the recent times we have seen that uh biological uh, biological methods of reproduction have been replaced by scientifically advanced methods but that has been mostly explored among uh, heterosexual couples especially in india though we see a lot of research going on on the western society of how same sex parents have sort of um, uh, sort of encountered uh, experiences of adopting either by uh, private agencies or government agencies or internationally this india kind of remains the place where surrogacy takes place but only for the western couple and this is not uh, much e explored in in the indian society lastly uh, my methodology would include um, i i uh, aim to conduct uh, in depth interviews to uh, to collect narratives through my participants and my field of research is mainly in india uh, i'm trying to uh, my my data collection is still in the process it's still going on so um, that is one thing although there are some um there are definitely uh, quite uh, limitations of this research because still um same sex relationships or lgbtq community do not find it very comfortable to come out in public so finding uh, participants is a difficult task but yes uh, of course like there is also the other side of it where people are coming out and are willing to talk so these are some of the limitations that um, as a researcher i need to keep in mind i i had put some of the findings in my uh, in my presentation uh, so these these were some of the interview questions where i got uh, responses i'm not i'm not going through uh, the detail of the responses but some of the analysis over here that i found is that identity formation is depended more on the culture than it is um, on legalization so mo mo mostly one of the most important point that has been raised by the participants during the process of interview is that how they sort of um, gives importance to the law but they are more hopeful towards the cultural acceptation to be able to be a part of the mainstream society so that is that is one of the concern that i saw secondly identities cannot be studied in isolation rather uh, rather it is an intersection of one social position positionality awareness of legalization creates more empowerment Friend friendship networks are source of family formation i was talking about this earlier in my discussion uh, social labels shapes behavior and affects family formation and adoption strategies so uh, so uh, yeah i mean that that was it and i i i still like have a lot of hope on this study because i feel like this is one of the studies which has which has not been uh, explored in india as much as it should be and i i i feel like the lgbtq community in the uh, in the asian asian culture is sort of uh, it lacks a representation we mostly study about the western society about its progressiveness but uh, but we lack but we lack a representation um, of the global south as we were as we were talking about so that was my presentation thank you thank you thank you so much for your presentation and i think that we can it's very very precious thank you i think that we can leave the floor to piaya i'm sorry i'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name and i leave to you the the floor hello everyone it's morning here and good afternoon if it's afternoon where you are uh, warm greetings i'm bizay tamla rai uh, i'm at university of wisconsin milwaukee 
And uh, today I'm going to present uh, not asking to be their step wife. Uh, hopefully I can. So uh, not asking to be their step wife, patriarchy and within gender struggles of women street vendors in urban Nepal. And I focus on women street food vendors. Gayatri is a 40 year old Janjati woman and a street food vendor in Kathmandu Valley, the largest urban area in Nepal. Every morning, she takes her cart filled with large transparent cylindrical plastic container full of puri and another container of puffed rice and small containers of ingredients that are used to prepare street foods, pani puri and chalpade. Behind Gayatri, her husband follows with a bucket of water and a rag bag containing plastic bottles uh, filled with water. And if her husband is not around, her two sons in school uniform follow her. One son carries bucket and the younger one carries the bag with the water bottles. So when her husband goes, uh, he's a driver. So when he goes to work and her children go to school, whole days he sells uh, the Pani Puri. And by herself, she has an education of primary school uh, and her average daily earning is about 1,200 uh, 1, rupees, that's about $12. There are about 30,000 street vendors in Kathmandu Valley like Gayatri. They are predominantly working class women and they are not monolith. Some are Hindu, some are non-Hindu Janjati. Janjatis are indigenous nationalities, mainly non-Hindu groups that constitute about 36% of population in Nepal. Janjatis include Serpas, Grungs, Magar, Rai, Limbus, and Tamangs. So uh, they, the women uh, street vendors, they are of different age group, they have different family structures, different place of origin. Existing feminist literature go beyond this formal, informal dichotomy. Uh, the the literature does and uh, past studies do a gendered analysis of organizing uh, how women organize in informal economy uh, what are their strategies to ensure dignified labor conditions and in the labor market and how they get empowered and also contest with the city officials for space but the existing literature has a gap uh, of within and between gender differences are less analyzed. So there is a double blind uh, patriarchy, that's patriarchy within family and uh, outside family, that's a state patriarchy as Tamang 2000. So I ask, how do working class women of high caste Hindu and non-Hindu Janjati ethnic groups navigate patriarchy while departing from domestic realms to urban public space as street food vendors. I use gender relations theory because gender uh, is seen as an ongoing dynamic process in this theory. So to give a little bit of broader picture of women's position in the context of Nepali society, let's look at women's movement in Nepal, which is very closely tied with the political changes. On the 1950s, women were more into uh, private rooms of their families, uh, largely because uh, there was Rana regime and it was predominantly uh, Hindu, right? It was known back then as a Hindu kingdom. In the 1950s onward, Nepal slowly started urbanizing and then opening up to the outside world. Until 1990s, there was Panchayat regime which uh, reproduced the uh, hegemonic. Hindu patriarchy. Uh, after 1990s moment, when Nepali women started to work outside the family and farm. But the gender norms of Hindu, uh, that's like unequal, that reproduces unequal gender relations, continued in workplace and public spheres. In nine, between 1996 and 2006, that was a decade long world Maoist uh, insurgency uh, where uh, 10,000 people or more um, lost their lives. But within that period, women rights activism among the minoritized women, like Janjati, Dalit, and Madesi, uh, became 
came up on the surface, right? After 2006, uh, there was a peace agreement between Maoist and political parties. There was people's movement and uh, 200 year old monarchical system was thrown. A uh, new constitution was promulgated, Nepal became republic, but still women are contending for equal rights, for example, citizenship through mother's um, name, right? That has been the biggest, one of the biggest challenges. So let's now get back to street vending. Street vending is viewed as one of the tangible manifestations of informal economy traditionally rooted in the cultural fabric of global South. Although Lars' body of street vending literature focuses on Southern cities in Africa, Asia, Latin America, but there has been a growing sociological inquiry in European and North American context. For example, Morales 1997 did an ethnographic field work in Chicago's Maxwell Street uh, Market. Uh, here on the left in the picture, you'll see a Chicago, um, I took it last month, uh, where we, we could see a person selling street foods on the right that was from the fields in 2017 uh, where you know that was and the kind of typical kind of uh, uh, a cart that I was explaining about cylindrical plastic uh, container with puris and puffed rice there yeah, right so so that's the typical uh, cart that we see uh, among you women vendors so anyways so the in the no north, in the northern cities, uh, like in U.S., right, like F Philadelphia, there are studies done there. Uh, a recent study in 2022, uh, there was a study done by Brion and uh, Campios uh, de Salas. Uh, th that was a case study on Los Angeles street vendor campaign. That was a movement that tried to rec reconceptualize street vending as a women's justice issue. If we look at the global south, street vending is one of the informal self-employment sectors, right? And where where women have significant share. And uh, the, the findings on uh, women's vending, street vending in global south has a mixed result. Some see women's entry into informal labor uh, as uh, a further subordinating them uh, and pushing them to uh, precarious working conditions, unequal earning, right? There was a study by Martinez in Cali, in Colombia, where men, uh, street vendors, were likely to earn more than women. In Bangladesh, there are very few women street vendors, uh, lastly because of the patriarchal social structure. Uh, whereas uh, a study by King in Ghana, uh, where w uh, women street vendors actually got empowered, they uh, got recognition in their community as income generator, uh, they built a strong social support networks and enhanced their self-esteem through their ability to make an economic contribution and uh, um, for their children's upbringing. Right. So l let me now uh, slightly talk about my uh, study. So it's an intrinsic case study, uh, as uh, Robert Steig uh, calls it, uh, and uh, and Robert Im talks about the case study design. So I followed them. So nine women street food vendors in Kathmandu were there. I spent about uh, one and a half year in the fields. As first three months, I explored around the city, navigating. Uh, and I did propulsive sampling, and there were varying grains of uh, my whole goal was to find women uh, that were of, you know, different brains, different age, uh, different place, of course. And uh, I came across seven ethnic Chinjati women, two high caste Hindu women. I did in-depth interviews in the streets. My interviews were arranged from one, uh, one with only one participant, uh, because she gave consent for her first interview, and then later she was a high caste Hindu, and she was afraid her husband might not like it if I interviewed her again. So I didn't interview her again. Uh, so um, others were multiple interviews, and maximum up to five interviews were taken. Uh, and each interview was for one to two hours. And two hours sounds long, but uh, when I did those interviews in the streets, 
So when uh, the women uh, often got um, uh, customers, at those times I stood aside and uh, you know took my field notes as I waited for them. Uh, and when they were not very busy, I um, started talking with them, having conversation with them. So I also was a consumer of street food. So basically, I also consumed the foods. Uh, and those age range of my participants were 28 to 62 years. Uh, all of them were married with children, uh, and two of them were grandma. So uh, one of my, let me share one of my participant stories, Sapana, right? She is 34 year old, so belonged to high caste in the group. She migrated from Nuwaku to Kathmandu when she, she was a child. Uh, she was married. At the age of 16, she has two children. Her husband is a carpenter. Uh, it's a wage uh, per hour wage paid labor and uh, she was a literate uh, third grade and she knew how to write name uh, her prior experience she was mostly a uh, house maker homemaker uh, but then she briefly worked in a private school for a salary of uh, three thousand that's about thirty dollars per month and uh, uh, there was no other benefit like leave and sick leave or any kinds of leave or other perks except uh, the school provided 50% uh, um, concession or discount on her son's uh, monthly fees. But, uh, but that was not enough. So she quit that job uh, and thought of starting uh, selling food. Street food, right? I'll come back to why she uh, sold food. Uh, let me introduce another participant, Charitra. She's a 62 year old Jindati ethnic woman. She also had a physical disability. She changed her, converted her religion from Kira to Christianity. She had a very supportive husband, but her eldest daughter didn't like her to get into the street. Why on streets? was her question when she shared her plan to start street food vending. But again, her motivation to uh, start street food vending was again a uh, necessity, uh, especially she was worried about her old days. Uh, she said, who would give me money? My husband's income, the, he, her husband's income was uh, 6,000 rupees. Uh, he was a watch person outside in the church and uh, that's about $60 per month. Was barely enough for our family. How could I earn? So she was more worried about earning for her oldest saving. Uh, so that was her motivation. So another participant, Manu, she is 31 year old Janjati woman, uh, two children, husband was a local construction, construction contractor. And uh, she had been a subsistence entrepreneur since seventh grade. She used to sell flowers in front of Mahathir Temple. Later, she handed over her business to her mother and she started chicken meat uh, and seasonal vegetable store. Unfortunately, she failed uh, one of the courses in finals of uh, in high school. Uh, so she uh, eloped, she got married with one of her customers and uh, they opened an optical shop that didn't go very well. So they uh, moved to uh, opening a restaurant uh, with a huge investment. But uh, April 2015's uh, earthquake in Nepal uh, that devastated their restaurant, right? Um, about 9,000 people lost uh, lives and it was a continuous earthquake. Uh, it was not pleasant. So following that earthquake was an uh, Indian geoeconomic blockage. So that created a fuel crisis. Uh, Nepal is a landlocked country and largely it depends on Indian border for supply of its any kind of imports, including oil. So they had to sell their restaurant and uh, shut it down, sell it. And uh, the options that were available for them, because again, uh, due to the blockade, there was no construction work. Her husband was basically unemployed. So they thought of opening a meat cold store, but that costed uh, money again, and they were not sure finding space and all. So she thought of going to Korea. She had studied Korean language uh, for foreign employment, but she wanted to be close to her family. So she thought of street food vending as an alternative. So let's come back to Sapana, uh, right? And why she got motivated to start uh, street vending. 
Her daughter, she passed 10th grade and wanted to join nursing school. She wanted to motivate her daughter, but uh, with her husband's income, that was not enough, right? So uh, she, she thought of, uh, and working for a private school didn't help her, so she thought of doing something on her own. She had friends who were street food vendors, so she thought they might help. So she talked about it with her husband. He said straight, no, you cannot. Uh, and when she her uh, when she met her friends, they also didn't encourage her. Uh, they said no income. There's no income here. You don't make any earning. It's a difficult task. You know you have to stand and all. So and she said, I was not asking to be their step wife. Maybe uh, they thought I will open a stall next to theirs. But if there was no income, why would they continue the business? She was very skeptic and she was frustrated because her friends didn't help her. So uh, this is another example where, uh, you know, how the st starting of the business was difficult. Uh, so uh, and but then uh, one Sarada, 42 year old uh, Janjati woman, she migrated from uh, Chetuan to Kathmandu. And she said, first, I did not have money for the training. The training came when she said how to prepare it uh, and then she went to buy ingredients uh, in a shop and she asked the shopkeeper how to prepare the street foods and he told her to get the training and she replied. First, I do not have money for the training. If I had, I would have spent that money for my family's grazing and she, she often used this metaphor grazing for household expenses, especially on food, right? Eating as her metaphor for grazing. Second, I grew up slicing onions, peeling off potatoes, cooking curry, sprinkling the right pinches of salt and other spices, and serving foods in my kitchen. Why would I pay to learn those kitchen skills? For me, the setting was only different. If my children did not complain about the foods I cooked, I thought of treating my customers like my children. This is how I gathered confidence. And she paused for a while and said, after all, with the support of my youngest daughter for the first three, four days, I was on my own running the business. And so for some women, it was expanding kitchen work. For some, uh, you know, they had, they felt, uh, you know, it's, it's different, but since they were not getting help, uh, and they didn't want to spend money or didn't have money to spend on uh, learning it. By, um, so they, they, they built their confidence in this way. So they were re-territorializing gender norms. Uh, they were taking home uh, kitchen work to streets, right? Thin, uh, preparing food skills. Uh, another interesting thing was about Muna. She also tried to pick and learn. She asked many other street vendors to help her. No one helped. So she uh, tried learning, uh, preparing at home. And uh, and uh, she, her, she had two other street vendors near her uh, place. So she, ha she thought, uh, what would be my competitive advantage? What new thing I could provide? And uh, something that new she thought of was, found was dahi puri. Uh, it's a curd, basically curd. It's uh, puri uh, and curd. And uh, we can see in the picture, right? Uh, that's how she prepared it. And uh, so she prepared learning. And I asked, how did you learn it? And she said, YouTube, right? So she, she, she even used new media to learn that. Uh, other other women, uh, some of them were already an addictive customers. They uh... all right. Something happened there, and uh, I'll 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 continue. So I thought I'll play the record because I would uh, over speak. Uh, I would be very excited to tell these women's stories and uh, and then I would over speak. So, uh, so, in, so what, what was happening was uh, many women were already uh, in their own words, very addictive. If they didn't have uh, one of the street foods, you know, they would not feel content. So they had to go out on the streets and eat. So some of them, uh, 
so one of the participants she used to while returning from school every day she used to have and then uh but then when she dropped out of the school her parents didn't give her extra money for snacks but then she was very addictive so what she did was she became an apprentice of one of the madesi vendors so previously last district vending was done by uh, Madesi street food vendors and uh, they uh, and then so so he took her as a free apprentice and then in return she would get uh, street food to eat so that's how she learned preparing street food uh, the, the, so uh, there was another uh, uh, street food vendor woman she was also very addictive and she, she and her husband was abroad so she thought I spend the remittance that comes from uh, abroad. Uh, why don't I start my own business so I can eat for free? So that's that's how she got motivated. So these women uh, tend to use a social capital. Uh, so they use their women network, for example, uh, purchasing secondhand secondhand postcards, mostly uh, from uh, other women vendors, for example, Sapana. Uh, although some of her friends uh, didn't encourage her to be street food vendor, she again had other networks with other women that helped her. Uh, so there was this struggle within gender, within women network as well, there was struggle, but they were also getting support from their ties. Uh, if old ties didn't work, they were forming new ties. Uh, she was uh, her, she met a new friend through her son's friend. So the friend, new friend was her, so she used to uh, drop her son at school and she met a woman who also came to drop her son. And she happened to be a street food vendor. So she uh, went to her street stall uh, to help. And then that's how she got sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, skill of learning. Uh, she had a difficulty finding a location in the beginning. One woman came and chased her away that you cannot stay here. You have to go away from here. Uh, but again, uh, she knew an, uh, an old woman, uh, older woman uh, who was a shopkeeper she referred to her as a mother though she was not her mother uh, but she referred to her as mother and uh, and that older woman offered her a very strategic location uh, a location between a junction where three uh, or four uh, there were three crossroads meeting and her the older woman's uh, shop was there and she allowed her you can stay outside of my shop in front of my street right and they kind of did this uh, also, there was a mutual benefit of this, like uh, there was kind of a guardianship. So the older woman, see if she had to use a restroom, uh, uh, Sapana could have a look at, her, look at her shop. If Sapana had to go somewhere and then the older woman could. So they, these women provided kind of a, a guardianship to each other. So uh, each other and her daughter also helped her, uh, helped her to uh, promote her stall as a hygienic stall. My daughter gifted gloves, nail cutter and apron to me. She told me that I, if I focused on my hygiene by keeping the stall clean, keeping my nails short and by offering Panipuri wearing gloves, then customers will like cleanliness and visit my stall again. And the globes will protect my fingers from being burned by chilies. You can see I prepared pani puri wearing gloves, and she very proudly was showing me, you know, the gloves. And then she was not wearing apron, and she was like, "Oh, today I'm not wearing my apron because I washed it, but I usually wear it." So I'm like very neat and clean, unlike you know uh, most other vendors. So so they were using this. Uh, uh, familial capital as well as uh, friend capital so th there is this contestation with like who owned the city streets conventionally it's the men right uh, women uh, especially young girls are teased in the street so, so these kind of things happen but then even in the street food vending as well there was this you know contestation of these uh, women for, for the space. There were four Janjati and one caste high Hindu women who worked until 8 p.m. to 9 p.m., right? And, uh, and mostly uh, others avoided uh, going beyond uh, late night, right? But these, these women uh, had their husband joining them for assistance and also for security reasons. 
uh, and others closed by 5 p.m. Like Ramana, the, the one with, with who I only had one interview, her husband was very restrictive and uh, she belonged to a high caste and she, she had to return back home early, right? And Goma, she was Janjati and she, her husband, she's the one whose husband was abroad and uh, she had to close early because uh, she didn't have support. Her husband was not around. So, and she had children to take care of. So she had to prepare them for next day's school. Uh, Nira was another Janjati woman. She was very new to business and she was mostly, uh, in the evenings, mostly people didn't come to her stall. So she was very new. And so she thought, uh, you know, to close the stall early. Uh, Sharada, she, she said the word grazing again. She had to go home early so that she can prepare grazing for her family. So uh, husbands were often, uh, you know, who initially denied, except for uh, Charitra's uh, husband. Most husbands denied, but later on, they also, once the business started kicking off, they started being supportive. So th there was this, you know, negotiation going on. In the beginning, there was like, no, you cannot do, you cannot be in the street to, hey, let me support you. So after seeing the cart, for example, Sapana's husband, who was a carpenter, made new boxes for the cart and bought a giant umbrella for the cart so that she could get shed uh, in the in the hot day. Uh, and then uh, she also said, my husband is, a, uh, is paid per hour. So her husband discouraged her closing. She would say, if you have to close, call me. So I would stay in the stall, you go to hospital or you go to school, wherever you need to go. Uh, and I will help. Uh, and Manu's husband used to cook dinner uh, until one evening. So she, she used to be her by herself. She's a Janjati woman and she used to by, be by herself. On What happened one time was a drunk cart came and almost turned her cart upside down. So for security reasons, she called her husband. Uh, and uh, Charitra, she had a disability. So, so her husband went out to purchase ingredients for her. Uh, Gayatri, like I told you, her husband helped her in uh, carrying water and also preparing in Puri. But this later, these women again uh, found preparing Puri to be very tedious. So they relied mostly on Madesi men uh, to prepare puri for them and they would buy it from those men uh, and so yes they were in the business but they were still relying on mail out there for certain tasks that they could not do by themselves so the, i was telling you about the sapana who got this strategic place uh, uh, with the help of the older woman. And this is the story where she had very difficulty in the beginning, uh, where she actually begged a person to, a woman to let her do the business and she was chased away. Uh, and then she was very frustrated at that moment. And she thought maybe this is the reason no one supports that women in Nepal has started going abroad for ways we are listening from uh, in the, our first presentation about women going migrant, uh, going for labor, right? So. She was thinking about, oh, this is the reason uh, at home uh, there's very, uh, you know, hostile environment. So my findings, uh, so my findings about this regular spot was, so Madesi men who were previously dominant in uh, street food vending, and Madesi men means men who are from, so Nepal has three kinds of land. One is flat land, one is hills and mountains. So Madesi is the flat land and people, men from Madesi, are usually seen, uh, used to be seen as street food vendor. And now women are coming into the picture. And these Madesi men are mostly uh, footloose. They would walk around their usual route or they would walk around the city street with their uh, you know, stuff. But women are mostly sedentary. They would stay in a particular place. And that place would be uh, five minutes you know, walking distance, not more than that from their place of residence. Except for Charitra, who had the closest proximity. See, see uh, her stall was just outside of a church because that church was the place where her, her husband worked. And she had also disability issues. So she could not walk off a little bit further like other women. Other women mostly placed her, their stall in a very uh, strategic place like road junctions. And uh, Muna, for example, she used her husband's network to find that place. Some women used other women's network. Uh, and uh, Nira, the new, new uh, vendor, she was like, she wanted to be close to Madesi men vendor because 
uh, she was new to the business and people would get crowded to the mother cement vendor. So when there's too much crowd, there will be trickle down effect. People would also come to her stall, but she would not want uh, to stay too close because people would only go to mother cement vendors and not come to her stall. And uh, times when mother cement vendor didn't come in that street, she would be happy because she could make, make more sales. Uh, so that was this <laughs> uh, interesting gender dynamics uh, between the vendors. So, uh, so mostly these women uh, looked for their children's future. Those were the motivating factor. All day saving uh, and uh, and their necessity were the uh, motivating factor for them to get into the subsistence entrepreneurship. They use their social ties, new media uh, like YouTube uh, and everyday practices uh, in, in being successful. Janjati non-Hindu women who were relatively gender equal compared to high caste Hindu women. Uh, so they had relative uh, flexibility in street food vending as well. Uh, and there was a negotiation with patriarchal structure, uh, both in family as well as in public space. Uh, and the public space are mostly gendered uh, and uh, women tend to uh, you know, extend their territory or claim those public spaces, uh, especially uh, by uh, you know, taking uh, support of husbands or kind of using this uh, guardianship like the, the older women looking at the, you know, Sapana and Sapana taking care. So this mutual kind of guardianship uh, helped them to claim this public space. So in conclusion, despite varying strategies to negotiate with double bind patriarchy, women were imp women in this sample uh, that I interviewed were empowered they were financially, and they were being able to make decisions previously. Most of them relied on, uh, especially the high caste uh, Hindu uh, working class women relied on their husband. Now they were making decisions. They gained power and sort of a control over certain aspects of their family and public life, especially decisions regarding the business and the money that came from that business. They had sort of a control on that. So future research could do an extensive survey of street food vendors. I said 30,000 street food vendors uh, and more, right? Uh, and uh, different categories. And I focused on street food vending. This could be selling other goods, selling electronics and to examine between and within gender differences, advantages, disadvantages by participating in this form of in, uh, economy. And uh, COVID-19 happened. And so this definitely disrupted how the, the way street food uh, would be, you know, offered and sell. So, so that would be another, how did this women cope uh, and mitigate, uh, you know, the, this kind of disruptions, uh, this pand global pandemic, and how did they continue their business if they continued, uh, would be interesting for future researchers to look at. And understanding this gendered relations uh, while formalizing informal economy. So there is a whim, you know, in, in, in international institutions like, uh, you know, uh, ILO focuses on formalization of informal economy, but it's very important to understand these gender relations uh, for this urban policy makers rather than like implementing cookie cutter kind of, uh, policies of formalization of informal economy. Uh, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I would be very happy to uh, answer in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. But uh, is there someone else who's going to, uh, to present? So if there are no more presenters, maybe we could uh, ask questions and uh, or comments uh, i find the for example the the discussion on uh the street the research because i was also thinking of doing research of uh, street uh, vendors uh and stalls uh in the philippines because i observed one time when i was there uh there were indian uh migrants to the uh, Philippines, and they are they were providing uh, loans to these women. And in the Philippines, there's a practice that you call usury. You borrow from persons who may have money, but then the interest rate is very very high. <laughs> so so I wanted to so this this uh, and I saw an Indian 
uh, men would go there, collect every, uh, every afternoon from the women uh, certain uh, pay for their loans. And they are in their motorcycles. And I was wondering, and I asked the women, who are those? Uh, oh, they're the ones who provide us. We pay to them every every day, you know. And so it usually, so he, <laughs> you see the uh, the Indian men, migrant. Uh, they were not probably born in the Philippines, but also making money uh, on petty capitalism. And uh, how, and it, it was uh, coming to my mind, how do we organize these vendors? How do we organize uh, these women so that they are not individual vendors and competing for space, but uh, organizing them uh, to, be, to have cooperatives? Uh, and, and so those, these are some, and I found your, <laughs> your research, I listened to it, but when I saw you, you know, uh, uh, presenting in person, uh, although we are we are far away, I, I mean, it was a different way of of listening because I find the <laughs> the the technology yes, but uh, you I, I cannot react immediately, you know. So thank you for your presentation. Okay, here is now Moren. <laughs> Thank you a lot for your presentations. Yeah, we are missing the last presentation because uh, we are missing the presenter. <laughs> so uh, I think that <laughs> we have a few, no, we haven't a few minutes for discussion, but I think that there are other questions or comments. Uh, they are very, very welcome. Please, Cynthia, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, th those are wonderful presentations. I, I think I missed a little bit of um, uh, we, 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 uh, I'm sorry if I pronounce your name wrongly. Uh, we, uh, we are, yes, uh, but I, I think he, he did a very good summary. So I, I had some ideas about, I think the all the three pre presentations are wonderful. I think I'm just going to ask a question to each of you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Professor McGovern uh, a question. So uh, it seems to me that, um, you know, um, I think uh, if I remember correctly, except for China, the, the, the new globalism policies executed by some, you know, like uh, international organizations such as World Bank and everything, uh, did not produce very uh, good results in terms of uh, helping uh, the, the local um, people in different countries. Uh, you know, starting from like Egypt, India, you know, the Philippines um, to be self-sufficient or, you know, economically. So I think that was the plan's original uh, purpose. So, uh, and and there's the, there's the gender dimension to this uh, in, in your presentation. Um, so did I, so my question is, um, is there a kind of like multiple, um, these, uh, disadvantage these women are experiencing you know because number one there this is the international policy right uh, executed in a certain way um, to to really advance uh, profits uh, for for corporations uh, number two there's the local government probably um, you know I, I don't know what their interest is in this but they they, they may have different uh, interests than the local people and thirdly um, um, I don't know the exact numbers for the economy in uh, the Philippines. Um, maybe women do have to have a job to support themselves and their family. And so, and, and fourthly, um, in terms of gender relations, you know, with the family. So that's, that's the gender relations with the state, government, and, you know, the, the gender roles in the society. In the private sphere, I don't know what their relationship is with their, you know, fathers, husbands, and everything in terms of uh, division of labor and, and things like that. So this is my question. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, um, uh, let me uh, begin with uh, uh, differences. Uh, I think your question, uh, differences of uh, women's experience, and, and then so let me synthesize everything. Um, 
uh, women particularly are the ones who are uh, because of uh, the and, and there are literature also like development debacle by Walden Bellio. Uh, the women uh, take up also the responsibility of uh, supporting the family. Uh, and there is a very high unemployment rate uh, uh, also among men. And women also do informally uh, engage in informal economy, vending and so forth. But uh, when the labor export program in the Philippines was started sometime in the early uh, 1970s and continuing today, uh, at first it was the men who were going to the Middle East in construction industries, but later on it was the women uh, who are migrating uh, in, uh, and, and in fact, uh, most of them, most of them are in the informal economy, but also in domestic work. Uh, the men are in construction in, in the Middle East. Uh, so there is uh, 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 responsibility also uh, the, the, the burden of these structural adjustment policies are borne both by the men and the women. So we, if the men are migrating, then family disruption also men get affairs, some family broken, and the children in my research, for example, in this book, sometimes grow up not really knowing very well their parents. And then when they go back, the parents, there is this kind of, I have not seen them grow. Uh, so uh, that's why these structural adjustment policies, as you have said, uh, more for the interest if you take a look at, of transnational capital and profit making, I begin to see that both the informal economy and the formal economy, really what, uh, what the structural adjustment uh, policies create in terms of job displacement and then migration, uh, there is uh, the informal economy also picking up, but it is also within capitalist relations. So we are not, uh, petty capitalism actually is, uh, becomes the foundation of global capitalism. So we need really to begin thinking, how can we create among grassroots uh, this kind of non-capitalist path, but more of uh, cooperatives and, uh, uh, and, and, and there are already uh, proposals for that in the peace, uh, peace agreement uh, peace talks of the uh, different groups like the National Democratic Front, uh, but the Philippine government keeps <laughs> suppressing that. And I have reviewed uh, that whole program, creation of cooperatives, of peasants, urban poor. Really, if we give uh, expression to this in policy uh, in different countries, right, uh, then it we would be able to, uh, let's say, organize them uh, in an international solidarity framework. Is there any other question that I did not answer? <laughs> well, thank you so much. That's very informational and and uh, and and important. Um, the yeah, those are you know pretty much my my questions. You know, it's how 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 their life kind of like uh, uh, unfolds. On a daily basis, and yeah, how, how they how they cope with that. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, if I may ask um, here uh, a question here, data a question. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's that's very interesting. I mean, um, in terms of uh, um, gender relations in India, one book that I cited many times <laughs> is by um, um, uh, Doctor. Um, Hostchild. Um, so she was talking a lot about, uh, she was comparing uh, gender relations in the US, which is the uh, market economy versus India, um, which is, you know, which is, is a traditional society and everything. So she mentions a lot of the, um, the gender relations, uh, mostly among heterosexual 
um, you know, a relationship. Uh, for example, there's the, um, so like older generation women would uh, be sympathetic with the younger generation um, in terms of their rights, human rights, right? At the same time, they are coordinating with uh, patriarchy in terms of um, um, doing the things they're supposed to do, right? So, so the so-called colonized colonizer. Um, and in terms of uh, women in the same generation, there's the um, status hierarchy based on whether this person is the first wife, the second wife, or third wife. I think the, the time frame that she wrote her book on was probably up to the 1990s or early 2000s. Um, so I just wonder, you know, because LGBTQ um, legal rights or like all their rights in the in the society, uh, whether people really respect that or not, comes out of this this kind of like uh, background. Uh, you know, for example, caste system was 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 legally abandoned. Uh, probably in the 1990s, but then there's social code um, uh, still. So I just wonder how this would relate to LGBTQ um, movement and the outcome of the movement um, and, and, and their recently gained legal rights. Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, can you please restate the question once again? So I'm. I'm. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the gender relationship relations in the larger society in terms of, uh, you know, men versus women, um, hierarchy among women would impact um, the edge, the 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 rights, legal rights, as well as their, you know, like social rights uh, now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, like. Um... So like I was telling in my presentation, like India still holds that uh, dominant ideology of its spiritualism, where it sort of has a very definite um, gender roles assigned for men and women. So in, in cases where there's a hierarchy of women, the problem is that it still falls back to that given patriarchal system that rose at during the 1940s at the time of the rise of the Indian nationalist movement. So, so given saying that, um, I would say that uh, there are a lot of um, differences. Now, what I'm saying cannot be generalized throughout India because the, pa the power hierarchy is also different in different region. Uh, like there's a rural, so, so, uh, rural and urban divide. Um, like there's, there's the north, uh, north and the southern divide. There is also the east and the west, uh, the linguistic uh, community divide. Um, so, so I would say that the hierarchy basically depends on uh, a lot of intersections of the of the social category. Um, so yeah, I would say that how it affects is is how not only the power hierarchy uh, that interplays between the between women in the Indian society, but is also sort of influenced by the global uh, politics of power play um, throughout. So. Uh, I think I think that is how uh, it has affected the Indian society so far, and hence we we are fortunate enough to sort of witness this change, uh, the enactment of the law. I don't know if I have been able to answer the question. If not, please do do ask. Yeah, I'd me. like to uh, clarify what I heard. So when you mentioned the rural versus urban divide south versus north east uh, versus west is this is more global right is you're not talking about no I'm, no I'm talking about India you you were At talking about I, India. yeah yeah oh so uh, so the rural versus urban uh, divide basically like you know rural area is pretty much like underdeveloped urban area some um, uh, areas are highly developed we but there's there are still kind of like uh, you know class difference right 
Yes, there is. But in terms of speaking about uh, the identity politics that is built uh, for sexual minorities, I would say that uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of uh, very clearly distinguish between the rural as underdeveloped or the urban as highly developed, because mm -hmm. the way uh, sexuality is performed cannot mm -hmm. be termed as underdeveloped or uh, overdeveloped. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm, not, so I'm just saying the economic kind of situation uh, in rural um, versus. Yeah, yeah. Right, and South North is also like kind of this, this kind of contrast and East and West is the same. Linguistic, there is the linguistic issue as well. You mentioned. Yes. I'm, I'm just trying to um, yes. to understand. Yeah, when you when you had the the three you know three uh, dichotomies, uh, what what do they mean within the context of India? So uh, I would like to I would like to clarify that more about the economic economic part because I am looking at the social and the cultural part more right now than the economic part. So probably I might be able to partially answer your question. So when I was talking about the divide or the social positions in the Indian context, I was talking about how power play, uh, how social and cultural power play sort of uh, reshapes the identity of sexual minorities. And in terms of economy, do yeah. Sorry, sorry. go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go yeah. So I understand now. So when you when you talk about rural versus urban, south, north, east, west, is more about power structure, and you yeah. also mentioned the perceptions of homosexuality in Indian culture, which is not uh, which is not very receptive, basically, which is not very right now. Right mm -hmm. now, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, I, I do have, I, since then I'm dominating the dialogue, but since, you know, um, if, if Dr. Uh, Tateri has, has a question, uh, please ask. I can ask the question up to you to, uh, uh, to be, be uh, yeah. I can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I do have uh, a question. I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderfully done uh, field work. Uh, about women vendors in uh, Nepal. So um, I'm, I, 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 I know about the caste system in India. So obviously Nepal uh, has a kind of similar uh, system when you mentioned um, some working class women from high caste versus low caste. So is that more social um, caste or people's you know, social code, although there's no uh, formal uh, system, uh, caste system. And my, my second question is, um, how does class and how, you know, like uh, uh, unfold, uh, again, this background of formal or informal or uh, legal and uh, social caste system? Thank you. Uh, to Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Chang, for your question. Uh, the The caste system is uh, something <clears throat> uh, that's caste, especially caste based discrimination, is uh, illegal. It's uh, not allowed by law, and it's mostly the social construct, the remnants of you know the past regimes that have gone, and the and the gender norms that you know uh, limited uh, women in the past within the domestic realms. So it's more like that, uh, like uh, a, a subtle chord there. You know, no one talks about. Do you have a caste discrimination? No one says it's there, right? It's, oh, who talks about caste? You're, you might be talking about last century. We all are very equal, right? But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, everyday practices, and that enters very subtly, right? Even <clears throat> uh, the women, uh, even the non, uh, even the Janjati, non-Hindu women, uh, they, they, they in, within the family, they might have this, you know, a little bit of freedom and autonomy, but within the state patriarchy, 
they are still within the state patriarchy. So they would play, the negotiation would go like, oh, my husband prepares that, that street food better than me. And maybe he does, but it, it's coming from, you know, you're appreciating. So, you know, so there's, there's lots of hidden stuff going on. Uh, and uh, I didn't find, again, this is only nine uh, participants in that interview. I did walk around several other women vendors, but I didn't find <clears throat> uh, so lo low cost uh, women vendors because it's so the so-called low cost or so-called untouchables are again, uh, perceived or stereotyped as we cannot eat, uh, you know, food that are touched by them, right? So, so that subtle stuff is there. Uh, but again, formally, uh, very openly, society-wise, you know, uh, I, I, I might be criticized, like, hey, you, you are doing some laundry washing in some conf conferences, but uh, there's no caste discrimination, right? So that, that is there. Uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I missed your second question. That was very important. I remember it's very important. <laughs> would you, would you mind helping me? Yeah, yeah, answer? great. Yeah, now I understand it's, it's more kind of a social code. Uh, people don't say it because it's, it's illegal, but they do it, right, in a subtle way. Um, so how, how, I think my second question is, how do class and cost, the social cost, intertwine? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... As, as we look at, so these are working class women that I uh, looked, right? Uh, if you look at uh, middle class uh, women, uh, then th they're the tension of, uh, so again, the public space and that might come into interplay, but they're more into uh, relatively formal kind of, uh, if they are entrepreneurs, relatively formal uh, or more formal kind of occupations like teaching, uh, nursing, uh, you know, but again, we can see the gendered occupation as well within the middle class as well. Uh, but yeah, we, we do, we do see, uh, you know, uh, there are more similarities, I think, in the working class. Uh, but again, I, I, this is not out of, <laughs> this is out of more like observation and study rather than uh, research. But in, uh, in, as we go higher class, uh, you know, there, there, there are again differences, but it's more towards, uh, they're into education. If you see uh, most of these working class women, only few had high, high school education, right? Most of them had second grade, third grade, barely could write name. Uh, but when, you, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, ha formal like uh, middle class, again there is also struggle. Like again, who is in the authority position, right? And traditionally, it has been uh, the high caste Hindu men, right? And women are slightly coming into picture, but mostly it has been high caste Hindu men in 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 dominantly in those sectors. So uh, again, caste do interplay, like getting, for example, academia, getting tenured position, right, in, in, in Nepali academia. It's difficult for people coming from uh, disadvantaged background, but obviously they are breaking the glass ceiling. That's the, uh, you know, positive note. But again, there is a huge negotiation and navigation going on there. Th thank you. Thank you. I think you kind of answered my second question when you answered my first question somehow. So number one, these are all working class women because they are not doing middle class jobs, right? Like teaching and everything. And number two, um, if you compare low cost versus high cost, uh, even the the um, even though the uh, low cost uh, women could could still you know produce enough money to to invest in this, their business are doomed. It's doomed to fail because nobody's going to to touch their food. So, so the high cost uh, vend uh, women, uh, women vendors probably have a better chance if they, you know, if they do the business basically. And, and then this, um, uh, this non Janjati, they come into the picture in a different uh, area. They have sort of a liberace kind of equality within family. I talked about a case of Sarada. Her husband didn't oppose her. Right. Uh, and other uh, non. So it was very easier for 
uh, non uh, Hindu women to convince. And these are not low caste. They are just in the conventional uh, caste system. They are put at put at like you know in hierarchy. But these uh, non jati non Janjati women are not untouchables. They are like uh, if you're familiar with. Uh, uh, caste system in India. It's similar in Nepal, but it's again quoted slightly differently given the ecology in the past, right? So it's, but then it's similar, especially with the untouchables, right? Uh, so they didn't, they were not in the picture, but this non Janjati women had an interesting dynamics. They could claim the space, uh, you know, the, the, the way they claim their space in family. They could claim the public space as well uh, with relative ease uh, than uh, than the high caste women. Oh, so the low caste women actually have uh, uh, an easier time in public and private space. No, so the, the, I'm no, I'm I'm sorry to confuse you. <laughs> so in the in the caste system, it's the in the past even the non Hindus were brought into the caste system. Like for example, uh, Muslims they they follow completely different religion, right? But they were put at the lowest strata of Hindu caste system. Uh, these non, these Janjati, meaning Janjati, meaning indigenous peoples, they didn't follow Hinduism, right? Uh, they followed their own religions like Kirat, uh, Buddhism, other religions. But they were also brought into Hindu caste system and put into different strata. Uh, but these, these, they in in the traditional Hindu system, they were put in a strata that they were lower than the high caste but they were above than the untouchables. So in the conventional Hindu system, they are somewhere in the middle, but it's not necessary that they follow Hinduism. Like I gave you an example of uh, 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 Charitra, right? She was a Kirat, but she converted her religion to Christianity. And Kirat is not, uh, not a Hindu religion. They follow different reasons. So there's this uh, relative gender equality in these indigenous people's uh, communities uh, compared to conventional uh, you know, Hindu, Hindu, Hindu society. Uh, so, so that was the interplay. So there is no like dichotomy. There are layers in, in the caste uh, um, system as well. So religion is also a fact in this. Thank you. Those are my questions, and thank you so much to all three speakers. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and also for the replies. Very, very interesting presentation we had today. Thank you. So we are approaching to the end of our session, and uh, I think that uh, I have just some closing words and final remarks. I would like to thank you again. Uh, for this very, very interesting discussion, presentation, uh, and uh, so participation. And so you will find a video recording of this live session on the session webpage. So we have this kind of legacy <laughs> online for years and years. <laughs> so, but it's a, it was a very, very interesting uh, session. I don't know if uh, Ligaya have some final words or remarks uh, for um, everyone. You need to unmute the guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, one of the important reasons why we organize this uh, transnational uh, initiative project, this is the first time we are doing this, is really to network uh, people from different parts of uh, the world. Uh, and we could not do that by physically coming because it would be very expensive and also because of the pandemic. Uh, and what we really wanted was to create uh, networks among us uh, so that we can continue our discussions, not only uh, because of research, but also maybe we could begin thinking about uh, themes of partnerships uh, in research or any other like actions that we can do. Some of us are activists, scholar activists, uh, because that is part of our uh, notion of what a scholar should be, scholar activist. 
So we hope that this will not be the end. Uh, we, uh, we, we can join the international, the transnational initiative committee uh, because this is a reach out. And really I'm very amazed uh, with, the, with the papers <laughs> and then presentations. I listened to the, to the way late at night and then I, I was already in bed and I still listening. And then, and then when you see present in person, it's very different. And I, one thing my struggle is I do not like talking to machines. So <laughs> we had to re-record several times my presentation and still I was unhappy, but somebody told me you are so perfectionist. So just send it. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then, so I was able to, to overcome. We had difficulties and I can see that, uh, uh, you might have also experienced some difficulties, you know, recording and then deleting and then <laughs> rechanging. So please share that with us because we will uh, uh, evaluate. This is our first experience. Uh, we would like to hear from those who are not in the Transnational Initiative Committee. So, uh, and you join, <laughs> join the international uh, Transnational Initiative Committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ligaya. And thank you, everybody, again. And uh, we hope to, to meet you again at one of the next events uh, organized by SSSP. Thank you. Thank you. A very, a good luck for your, with your research and, uh, and your work. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone.